Today's shir begins eight lines from the top of Daf Chof Vov. We continue in the general topic that we have been discussing since our last year, and that has to do with establishing someone's status as a Kohen or a Levi based on things that we see. Tanya, Rebbe Shimon ben Elozer Omer, Keshem Shetrumo Chazoka Lekuna, Kach Maiserishon Chazoka Lekuna. Just like one who receives the Truma tithe is a sign of his having Kohen status, so too seeing someone receive the Maiser Rishon tithe is the sign of his Kohuna status. And one who receives a portion in a court, that does not indicate anything concerning his status. Now this source is a very difficult source to understand. The first problem is that Maiserishon is a tithe that is, from the Torah's standpoint, is given to Leviim, not to Kohanim. And the conclusion of this source that uh, receiving a tithe in court doesn't prove anything. Well, if in if the, if the, if in court you can't come to conclusions, where in the world could you come to any conclusions about anything? All of these points will be discussed in the Gemara. On the side of the Gemara, we have a no say topic heading where we've written Shitas Rebeloza Ben Azaria. The Meiser Rishon Laachar Haknas Havi Simin Lekuna. We're going to see an Tanaic authority that says that, in fact, the Meiser Rishon distribution, the receiver of a Meiser Rishon tithe, after a penalty was imposed, we'll see in the Gemara what penalty we're referring to. The Meiser Rishon becomes a sign of Kehuna. Now the Gemara. The Gemara asks, Meiser Rishon de Levihu. Meiser Rishon is a tithe that's given to Leviim. The Gemara answers, so the question then being, how can the source say that the receipt of Meiser Rishon is a sign of Kehuna? Kerebelozer ben Azariah, in accordance with his approach. Desanya truma lekayin, Meiser Rishon de Levi divere bekiva. Rabbi Elozer ben Azariah omer, Meiser Rishon af lekohen. Now we've dashed underlined Rabbi Elozer ben Azariah, and we want, we want to focus on his opinion. Whereas Rabbi Kiva gives us what we call the standard approach that Truma is given to a Kohen and Maiserishon is given to a Levi, Rabbi Lozer ben Azariah says Maiserishon is given, and now the wording here is important to note, Af the Kohen, which is even to a Kohen. Well, if you're going to say things that way, even to a Kohen, there still is room for questioning how can the source above say that Maiserishon is a sure sign that the receiver of it is a Kohen. Rabbi Loza ben Azar is not saying that. He's saying even a Kohen could receive Maiserishon, but that's not to the exclusion of a Levi. The Gemara asks, A more dumb Rabbi Loza ben Azar, Afla Kohen. Granted, Rabbi Loza ben Azar opens up the option of a Kohen receiving Maiserishon. Le Kohen velo le Levi mi Omar, did he say only Kohanim get and not Levim? The wording would indicate that Kohanim receive Maiser Rishon and, and Levim also can receive Maiser Rishon. So how can we <coughs> take the unnamed, the, the source uh, in, that was uh, presented by Rabbi Shimon ben Elozer above and say that that's according to Rabbi Elozer ben Azariah that Maiser Rishon is a sure sign that it's a Kohen? Not so. The Gemara says in, yes, he did say that only Kohanim receive Maiser Rishon, Bosser de Kansinhu Ezra. After Ezra, upon his uh, return, uh, with the, upon his uh, journey to Israel with the returnees from the Babylonian exile, he, uh, he Ezra, noticed that there were no Levium that participated in the return to Eretz Israel. And because of that, he imposed a he imposed a fine that Levium no longer uh, receive are to receive Meiser Rishon. So after the knas, after the fine 
imposed upon them. They, uh, the, the, if you see someone uh, after that, after Ezra, if you see someone receiving Meiser Rishon, so Rabbi Loza ben Azari will tell you that this is a Kohen. The Gemara asks, V'dilmo ikru v'yavu You see someone receiving Maise Rishon, how can you be sure that it's a Kohen? Maybe it just happened that they gave the Maise Rishon to a Levi. The Gemara has an answer. Note that it's a long answer. Omer Avchista, Hacha b'may askinon. The source in which we were taught that Maise Rishon is a sign that he's a Kohen, we happen to also know that the father of this individual is a Kohen. And regarding this person that, that received the Maiserishan, a murmur or a rumor went out, the Ben Gerusha Uben Chalutzahu, that the father who was a Kohen married a divorcee or a woman that received chalitza. In general, a Kohen that, that in, in fact married a Grusha, the son is called a Cholol, and he is not considered a Kohen whatsoever. He's considered a Yisrael. So we have someone who received Meiser Rishon. We know his father was a Kohen. Rumor went out that the father married a divorcee. The Cholku Leila Dide Meiser Beveis Agronas. And he w- was nevertheless a receiver of a Meiser portion at the granary. So, what is the uh, status of this, uh, of this individual? Levi the Lav Levi who? The, the son cannot be a Levi. The father is a Kohen. The, a Kohen cannot bear a Levi. Ma'iko what, what else is there? What other option is there? Ben Grusho Ben Chalutza who? The, the, the father had married a, uh, a divorcee or a Chalutza that would render the child a Cholol, a non Kohen. Lo mi bayo le mad yomer maiserishon osir lezorem de lo havu yavile. I don't have to tell you that this child is 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 not a ben grusha, according to the opinion that maiserishon is forbidden to be given to zorem. Zorem are non kohanim. A cholo, for example is an example of someone that we would call a Zari, as the status of a Yisrael. The Yisrael is a Zar. So, uh, according to the opinion that Maiserishon is not to be distributed to Zorim, cannot be given to Zorim, it's clear then that this son, that though might, there might be a rumor that he's a Ben Grusha, but at the granary they're giving him Maiserishon. They wouldn't be giving it to him if he was a Cholol. Even according to the opinion that Maiserishon can be eaten by non kaihanim including a cholo, that's as far as as uh, giving him a sandwich of it. You know, in other words, uh, if you happen to have been the proper receiver of Maiserishon, so you can you're, you're a levi, let's say, or you're going after the class of, of Ezra. You could give a non Kohen some of your Maiserishon. Afol betoiras haluka lo yahavile. But at the formal distribution point, at the granary where the tithes are are uh, formally distributed, you wouldn't give that to a czar. So therefore, there's only one conclusion that you can reach when you see this fellow whose father is a known Kohen. Although there are rumors that the, that father had married a Grusha, and yet you see this son receiving at the formal distribution site of the Trum of the Maiser Rishon tithe, and he, the son, is receiving a portion. He's not a Levi. His father is a Kain. He's not a Zar. He wouldn't be receiving it at the distribution site. So there's only one conclusion left, and that is that he is a Kohen. 
We saw above in the source the following quote. We have a little arrow to the side of the Gemara text. You can see where it comes from above. The hacholek beves din eino chazaka. Someone who receives a tithe in the court that doesn't demonstrate his status. Well, iba based in lo havi chazaka. If in the court you can't you can't uh, assume a a given status, hecha have you chazaka, where then can you do so? Omar Rav Sheshes Hochi Ko Omar. Rav Sheshes explains the source thusly. Hachoylek truma benichse oviv im ochiv, but based in eino chazaka. A man died, leaving an estate. And in the estate, amongst the different possessions, there was some truma. Truma is uh, grains, it could be grains, it could be barrels of wine, and there was truma in this estate. <clears throat> and there was a, a fellow dividing the estate and taking a, uh, taking a portion of the truma in this estate division. So, and the, the division of the estate is in the, under the uh, auspices of the court. So the source is saying, this is not considered uh, a means of establishing kahuna status uh, in order to let us say quell rumors uh, regarding the uh, the fellow's mother that she was a grusha that she was a divorcee and hence he himself would be a cholo. So once again, there's a court distribution of uh, of an estate. And truma is being divided, and one of the boys is taking some of the truma. We're saying that that is not proof that this boy is a Kohen. After all, we did point out that there were rumors that the mother was a Grusha. And those rumors having having been uh, raised, (coughs) this court distribution of truma is not going to quell those rumors. The Gemara is Pshita. That's obvious. Maybe we have to just say this, even though it's obvious. The the father died. The father might very well have been. He was a legitimate coin, and he received a number of barrels of truma wine. The the wine after the coin receives it becomes the property of the kohen. When he dies, so his property is distributed. The 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 son, one of the sons that receives it, because you saw him in court receiving some truma barrels. That doesn't mean that the son is necessarily a proper coin. He, he might very well be a cholo. The fact that he's a cholo doesn't prevent him from inheriting uh, the, the father's estate, which is essentially a financial um, uh, action, division of the estate. So is it, is that, is it, is it, is it not obvious then that seeing the, the uh, distribution of the barrels of truma wine doesn't indicate that the son is a coin. He might very well be a cholol, just like the rumors are saying. So why is it, why is it necessary to teach something that's obvious? Namely, it says, Eino Chazoka. So the Gemara answer is, I'll tell you why we have to teach this. Mahu de Tema, one might have thought, Midahanoch Lafila, from the fact that the other brothers are receiving the barrels of wine and will, cons- will actually consume it, Hai Nami Lafila, this one's receiving of it is also uh, for his consumption of it. And if he's going to, if he's going to actually drink it himself, that would be a sign that he is a kohen. Komash Malon. So we're telling you, Hanoch Lafila, Hi Lizvuni. In this distribution, those that those sons that of concerning whom there were no rumors, they'll take the truma wine and just like their father was a kohen, they'll drink it as kohanim consume truma. And this son, concerning whom there were these rumors that his mother, his mother obviously is a different woman than, their, than the other brother's mother, his mother may very well be, a, as the rumor says, a, uh, a divorcee. And the Cohen having married her m- makes this son a cholo. What will he do with the truma which he cannot eat? Lizmuni means he can sell it. He can sell it to other kayanim and benefit from the value. We had a Mishnah back on the Chof Gimel Amit Beis. Our hope is that you can access that Mishnah on Chof Gimel Amit Beis. 
Uh, I'll just read the necessary section uh, for uh, our upcoming Gemara. It said there, Rebuta Omer Ein Malin Lakuna Al Pi Eid Echad, that we don't uh, allow someone through the testimony of one witness to be considered a Kohen. Omar Rebbe Lozer, Amosai, when is it that we don't trust the testimony of a singular witness? Bemokim Sheish Oyrin, when there are rumors uh, concerning his, uh, his um, status, uh, rumors claiming that he is unfit, that he's puzzled. When there are no rumors cast about an individual, so we can trust the testimony of one witness. Rav Shimon seems to say the same thing, that we can trust the testimony of one witness to establish someone as a Kohen. In Jewish law, when we speak about testimony, generally speaking, true Torah solid testimony requires two witnesses. In, uh, accepting the, the testimony of one witness is itself something that's uh, um, somewhat unique. Revelozer is willing to accept the testimony of one witness when there's no one challenging this person's uh, Kohen status. Reb Shimon Leo, as we said, seems to say the same thing, that we'll accept the testimony of one witness uh, and it's very reasonable to assume that Reb Shimon Leo is not saying that we're going to accept the testimony of one witness even in the face of, of rumors. So, if that be the case, Rebbe Lozer and Rebbe Shemuel in the Mishnah, Chav Kimul Omed Bez, seem to be saying the same thing. So now we turn to our Gemara. The Gemara quotes a part of the Mishnah that we're not really focusing on. Rebbe Yudah Omer, Ein Ma'al Nukun Al Pied Echad. And then the, the continuation is what is of importance to us, like we just read. Reb Shimon ben Gamliel, Hainu Rebbe Lezer. According to the way the mission appears on Chav Gimel Amit Beis, they are saying one in the same. They're saying the same thing, that in the absence of any rumors, we will listen to the testimony of one witness saying that so-and-so is a Kohen. The question continues. V'chitema, you might say that there is a point of difference which whenever the Gemara does v'chitema, you know it's going to be rejected. So we're going to be left with this question in the meantime. You might say, as a point of difference, Aror Chad Iko Binaya. We spoke about uh, rumors being cast or, or protesters, someone challenging his Kohen status. So you might say that the, um, the challenge presented by one is the point of difference. One meaning a single person challenging his status. The Rebelezer Sovar Arachad, Rebelezer would say that a, an ur, uh, a, a uh, challenge made by one is considered a halachically valid challenge, and in such a case, one witness that's machshir the individual as a coin would not be accepted. From Shemuel Savar Ira Trey. And Shemuel says that less than two, it's not considered an error at all. And therefore, if you have one person challenging this, uh, the, the individual's Kohen status, one witness will be able to knock out the challenge. A challenge, according to this <coughs> uh, uh, suggestion, within Reb Shimon Leo, cannot be less than two. Well, this distinction, though, the Gemara rejects. According to all opinions, a, an Irur, a challenge to one status, cannot be uh, advanced with less than two people. So, that's not going to, the, the suggested point of difference of Irur Chad is not a point of difference. And what are we talking about in our Mishnah? The individual concerning whom we're going, we have these uh, eight echots testifying, the individual is someone whose father we know to have been a Kohen. 
And a rumor went out that the father had married a divorcee or a chalutza. And the result of that would be that this boy is a cholo, he's not a kohen. Fiachtinu, and they they removed him, or they 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 uh, they achtinu literally means is they put him down. They uh, had him descend from his kahuna status until they checked out the coil. Notice there's a word here, the coil. That's a a mere rumor went out. And a, a singular witness comes in and says, I know this guy is a Kohen, meaning his mother was not a divorcee. We continue at the top of Omid Beis. Ve'askine. And they put him up again to his former Kohen status. Where you have a Kohen, a mere rumor, one Witnesses certainly believed. The Asu Beitrevi Amri then two came in and said, Ben Grusha Ben Chalutzo, he is not a Kohen, he's the son of a divorcee. The Achtine, and then the court dismissed him from his Kohen status. The Yosu Eidecha Viomar Yodano Be the Kohen, who, and another witness comes, a singular witness comes again. So the second singular witness comes. So I know that he is a Kohen. Udakule Alma, everyone, whether it's Rebbe Lozer or Shlomliel, will agree. It's Starfin Liedus. When it comes to saying testimony in court, one plus one equals two. That means even though they didn't say their testimony together, we add them together. So they become a unit of solid testimony of two witnesses. So you have two witnesses saying, uh, in in effect, you have two witnesses saying that he's kosher. Now we have this guy going through what would have, what might appear as a bit of a yo-yo experience. Vehocha in now in the Mishnah on Chavkim on the base, the machlokes between Rabbi Lozer and Rabbi Shimon is as follows: B'mechash lezilusa de beidino komifligi. How much concern do we have to show for the honor of the court? Zilusa is the disparagement. Should we worry about the court looking uh, as a as an indecisive type body, which doesn't add to the honor of the court? So, are we to take that into consideration? Once again, let's read that again. And we should note, by the way, on the side, we have a top, no, say a subtopic heading, Tziruf Edim, the issue of combining individual witnesses, uh, who, of course, uh, say the same thing. And a uh, second point, are we to concern ourselves with the dishonor, the possible dishonor of the court? The Diamonds that you see are under the Mivne heading. These are our attempts to explain what is their point of controversy. So, in the meantime, we set up the case, the example. A fellow whose uh, father we knew to be a Kohen. Then there were some simple rumors out that the father married a divorcee. One witness comes and says that this fellow is, a, is certainly a Kohen. His mother is not a divorcee. Two witnesses come and say that he is a son of a divorcee. He's a cholo. And then one, a, another singular witness comes and says, no, he is a Kohen. As far as the two singular witnesses joining up, that is not a problem. They can join up. What is there left to concern ourselves with? Well, if we're going to reinstate him as a Kohen, well, <laughs> this fellow has already been knocked down, he's been dismissed, according to Rashi's approach, already twice by the court, once to investigate the rumor, the second was with the appearance of these of the two witnesses saying that he's not a Kohen, 
And now we're going to, if we reinstate him, it's going to be, uh, it won't be to the credit of the court. It gives us the impression that they're, that they're yo-yos. They're indecisive. And one day this way, and the next day that way. But, and so let's read that in the Gemara. V'hocha b'meichash lezilusa d'beidino komifligi. Tanakama sovar, Rebbe Lozer will be of the opinion. Kevon d'achtine, lo maskino le. Since we dismissed him, we knocked him down from the kahuna, we're not going to put him up again. Chayshinon lezilusa d'beidino. We must worry about the image of the court in the eyes of the public. If we look in Rashi on the third line from the top, the Chayshin Lezilusa de Beidino shall redo Shnei Pa'omim. We've knocked him down twice already from his uh, uh, original assumed Kohen status. V'yachshav Yalu, V'yavatlu Divrayim. And now if we put him up again to consider him a Kohen and, and uh, cancel their previous uh, ruling, that will result in Zilusa the Beidino, this cheapening uh, the, uh, of, of the honor of the court. Vahainu dikoma rabbalazar de meacha shorabnuhu al piho urin. Once we've uh, lowered him, we've, we've removed him through the challenge of the two witnesses. Ein malin al pi eid echod asheni. Afo pishiesh litzarfu imachir, even though. Technically speaking, he can join up with that original first witness to also constitute a unit of two witnesses. Nevertheless, reinstating him will lead us to this uh, situation of court dishonor. We continue in the Gemara. Reb Shimon ben Gamliel Savar. Reb Shimon Gamliel says as follows: Anan achtinole, anan maskinole. We, in fact, lowered him. We can put him back up. And as far as the honor of the court, this is not something we are to concern ourselves with. We don't have to worry about that. Maskif law Rav Ashi Ihachi. If it is as you said, that according to Rebbe Lozar, we're choshesh for the honor of the court. Then afilu tre utre nami. Even if two witnesses that testified he's a Kohen followed the first two that said he is not a Kohen, even if there were two that followed the two, the second two saying he's a Kohen, we would not put him back up. Why did we set up if? If this analysis is correct, that it's all a question of Chayshish Lezilusa de Beidina, why were we presenting it only in a case where a singular witness follows the two, that second singular witness saying that he's a Kohen, and, and, and our not reinstating him. Even if two witnesses came following the two that had uh, deposed him, and two more came saying he's kosher, even then, Rebbe Lozer would say, uh, you have to choshish for the zilus of the Beidina. So, from the fact that we did not, we're, we're not setting it up like that, but rather, as we said initially, it was one, two, and one, from the fact that that's the case, Elo Omar Ravashi, B'mitztarfin li edus komifligi. The issue at hand, the controversy is the ability to join together two in single witnesses that say the same thing, but they don't testify at the same time. In other words, that which we said on the third line from the top is something that's accepted uh, unanimously between Rebbe Lozer and Shimon Liel, not so according to Ravashi. The issue here is an issue of tziruf, of combining testimony. dehani tanoi. The machlokis that we are uh, saying it, that exists between Rebbe Lozer and Shimon Liel parallels a machlokis on this very topic that's found in the next Tanaic source, the Sanya. Notice we have a bracketed section we initially skip the brackets because the main point is that which follows the bracketed section. So let's read the section after the brackets. It says, 
testimony of witnesses, even if they saw the testimony together, their testimony is not going to be uh, acceptable until they testify together as well. Rabbi Nosson Omer Shomin Dvorov Sholze Hayom Ukshiovel Chaver Lemochor Shomin Dvorov. Rabbi Nosson says, No, they, it's enough that they saw the event together. As far as the method of testimony or the fashion in which they testify, one can speak his word today, and the second witness can say his testimony tomorrow. So, just like you see, there's a machlokis here between the Tanakama and Rabbi Nosson on having ind- single witnesses join together uh, after having stated their testimony on two separate days. That is the machlokis between Rebbe Lozer and Rebbe Shimon ben Gamliel. We uh, skipped a, uh, the section in this b'risa, which is not relevant to our Gemara, but it's brought here, the b'risa is quoted in its entirety, so let's read the bracketed section as well. The Sanya Ein Edusan Mitzarefes Ach Yir Shneim Kechad. According to the uh, first opinion, testimony, a unit of of testimony, two witnesses, they cannot testify unless they saw the event together. Rabbi Yeshua Ben Korcha Omar Filu Boze Acharze. Even if the two witnesses did not see the event. Uh, together, uh, Rashi gives an example of uh, one witness saw uh, Mr. A borrow money from Mr. B, and the second witness heard on another day. He heard Mr. A admit, "I owe money to Mr. B." So, according to Rabbi Shulben Korcha, they uh, they didn't see the loan the actual loan together. Nevertheless, they can both come to court if necessary and testify that A owes money to Mr. B. But our issue right now was not a, uh, an issue concerning seeing uh, uh, initial testimony, but uh, seeing an initial event, but rather two witnesses testifying about someone's status, two uh, individual witnesses telling us uh, information that so and so is a coin, but not telling us the information together as a as a unit of testimony, but rather of a, a a unit of witnesses, but rather one spoke today and the other one spoke the next day. So what we've done in this last discussion is we found the point of difference between Rebbe Lozar and Reb Shimon Ben Gamliel in the Mishnah on Chaf Gimel Amid Beis. We continue with a new Mishnah, and on the side uh, we have a Nosei topic heading. Chiluk be'inyan isha shenilkecha yadei hagoyim. A woman who was uh, captured, or we'll say taken by Gentiles. And when a, uh, a Jewish woman is taken uh, into captivity by, uh, by uh, idol worshippers, the the uh, strong suspicion arises that she was uh, used in uh, immoral uh, in in an immoral fashion uh, uh, intimacy to have ta- uh, w- w- uh, took place the issue of course uh, um, concerns a married woman that has intimacy with uh, with other uh, individuals with other men this will affect her status with regard to her husband. Um, that's in, in very general terms. So our note points out a case of a woman being taken by uh, Goyim, uh, and we're going to make a distinction between was she taken for, let's say, for uh, ransom purposes, or was she taken by the Gentiles because she was guilty of a capital offense and is has been judged to be put to death. The uh, Mishnah. Ha'isha shenech b'sha b'day o'yvdei k'chavim. The word nech b'sha 
you can see the root of the word is chavash or chavush is a woman who is uh, taken into captivity so a woman who was taken into captivity by the goyim al yedei momoin muteres labayla uh, she was taken uh, for in anticipation of receiving money in her exchange so if that's why they took the woman in order to get money she is muteres labayla we, will, uh, we make the assumption that they don't want to uh, violate the woman because they're interested in getting their money and they're figuring that if they violate her they're going to lose their chance of getting the money However, if she has been taken into captivity by the Goyim um, in advance of her being put to death because she was judged to be, uh, to be executed, she's also to her husband. Rashi says, They have in, her, in, their, in their possession right now a woman who's going to be put to death. So they're not going to treat her with any sense of dignity. They're going to treat her in a very hefker, loose fashion. We, we um, suspect that she may have willingly yielded to intimacy with one of these uh, uh, captors, uh, probably with the anticipation of that might help uh, save her life, and apparently it, it worked, because uh, we say she's also to husband, she's She's going to be uh, released after this, of whatever happened there, but she can't be with her. She cannot continue uh, living with her husband. Now, as we go on in the Gemara, we have some structural business to take care of. You see under the Mivne heading on the side, uh, Roman numerals 1 and 2 appear, and there's a double underline marking. These are Shnei Lishonis Bedivri Reb Shmuel Bar Yitzchak. Bar Rav Yitzchak. There are two... Uh, versions as to his uh, what he says. Shaimer he says the gam besoich lukichosa ayadei momon yesh lechalik. Even within the realm of her being taken for monetary purposes, there is room for making a chiluk, a distinction. On Chof Zayin Omed Aleph, there is a Rashi Dibor Hamaschil. Uh, ve'ika, uh, which um, is sensitive to the called the structure of the Gemara. If you have Chavzayin Amalaf available, so you look at the fourth line from the top, ve'ika de Rami la Mirma. This will this Rashi introduces our Roman numeral number two, and Rashi there says lo masni la lahad Rav Shmuel bar Yitzchok apirusha de masni sebeloshen lo shanu. Unlike uh, version number one, Rav Shmuel is coming to interpret our Mishnah. In version number two, that's not what is going to happen. El Romi Mirma Masnisin Brai Version number two pits a our Mishnah against another Tanaic source of Brisa. The Allah Shoni Rav Shmuel Chiluk Ben Yad Yisrael Takifa Liyad Ovidkom Takifa. Rav Shmuel's role there, Rav Shmuel Yitzchuk's role there, is to resolve the contradiction between the two Tanaic sources. In effect, it's the, it's the, the same concept is going to be coming forth from Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchuk. The question is, how is it being presented in the Gemara? So now that we've pointed that out, we go to the Gemara. Omar Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchuk. Omar Rav. Rav Shmuel quotes Rav saying, Lo Shonu, the din of the mission, the teaching of the mission, that if she's taken for money purposes, she is allowed to go back to her husband. Yisrael Takifa al You're talking about a society, a situation <coughs> where it's a Jewish government, where the Jews are in charge and the the Goyim, the idol worshippers, would be afraid to do something wrong so as not to lose their money. 
say they would be afraid to uh, have um, uh, intimacy with this uh, married uh, Jewish woman because uh, they would they feel that if they did that they, they might end up losing their money claims. Of all. He, Rav Shmuel continues, Yad takifal atzmon. This uh, expression is a euphemism, but for our purposes, it means the uh, idol worshippers are um, are in charge. They it's a it's an idolatrous government, a Gentile government, and the Jews are subservient to them. Afilu momoin asuro Even if her all their, her whole reason for captivity was simply to be able to get money in her in exchange for her. Even so, since it's a an idolatrous government, the assumption is made that they were uh, immoral with her, and as a result, she'll be forbidden to her husband. Mosiv Rova. Note the. In fact, we have a long question, and we have a, another marking, a house shape. On the side of our Gemara, we note these are Shnei Lushonis Bedivrei Rava. There are two versions of Rava. So this is the first version, and you can see we've noted it with a little house to the side of the Gemara text marked Aleph. Three lines from the top of Chavzayim Aleph will be the second presentation of Rava. So Mosiv Rava. Rava's challenging is now here to challenge by citing a Tanaic source to uh, the contrary, uh, to challenge Rav Shmuel's uh, point. Mosiv Rava, Heid Rabbi Yosi Akayin, Rabbi Zchaya ben Akatsav, Al Bas Yisrael, they said testimony concerning a particular woman, Jewish woman, Shehur Hana Ba'ashkalain. Hur Hana means that she was taken as collateral. There was a the uh, some uh, Jew or the Jews owed money uh, in Ashkelon, and we'll see uh, in the Gemara we'll see Ashkelon is a is a Gentile location, and um, they she was given over to the uh, to the goyim as a collateral. and her family uh, eventually they distanced her. The Eidel Meidim Oisa Shalonistera Veshalonitma. Those witnesses that said that she was taken into, um, she was taken as uh, as collateral. The, those same witnesses tell us that she remained pure. She was not victimized in immorality. The Amru Lohem Chachamim and the Chachamim said apparently to her family. They said, Imatem Maminim Shirano, if you believe that she was taken by the Goyim as collateral, Haminu Shalon Isdurabishalinmo, then believe that she was also not defiled. Then Iatem Aminim Shalon Isdurabishalinmo, if you refuse to believe that she remained pure, Al Taminu Shwano, then don't believe that she was taken into Captivity for uh, collateral purposes. The whole Ashkelon, the Yad Oivdei Kechavam Takif al Atzmon, the case of Ashkelon, which is the name of the city that we dashed underlined in the source, that's a case where the it's a a, a place where the idol worshippers are in charge. They've got the upper hand. It's a an idolatrous government. Vikotoni, and we continue now at the top of Chav Zayin Amalaf. And it says, Hurano in Nech Bishalo. That, uh, you see, in this case, we needed formal testimony to uh, ascertain her purity. Without that, so she would have been considered defiled. But only in the case of Hurano would we have considered her defiled in the absence of the testimony. But if she was uh, forcibly taken captive for money purposes, we wouldn't need formal testimony to ascertain her fidelity. 
We'll take a look at Rashi at the top. Hurana, the Midas. We spoke about her being taken as mashkon, as collateral. That is, represents a situation where she was given over to the Goyim by the whether the, the husband or the Jewish community gave her over, the Kevon de Giazman Volonifdes, and when the time, the due date, the expiration date of the loan came up and they did not pay the cash, she's considered theirs. She's considered their possession at that point. She's theirs to do whatever they want. And and in their eyes, that's the bedineim according to their justice system. That's legitimate. Oh, mishum hachi boin on edim meidim oy social onistra. And because of all of this, like this air of legitimacy that accompanies this, and she in, in their eyes, she really becomes theirs. You need the testimony to say that she did not go into privacy with them and that she remained pure. Right. The next Rashi nech b'sha. Where she simply she's grabbed in exchange for a money payment. She's grabbed for ransom purposes. The nechletes lahem. She doesn't become theirs. Lo We don't require formal testimony to ascertain her purity. momonu. Since they took her for getting money, they're interested in getting money. They they're not going to uh, violate her. They feel that if they violate her, they're not going to get their money, and and and, and it's a and a case and the cases where they don't, it's nechbesha. They 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 forcibly took her. What do we see from here? We see a challenge to Rav Shmuel uh, bar Rav Yitzchak. Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yitzchak wanted to say that if it's yad oiv they kechavim takif al atzmon, then for and for all money purposes, she's considered a goner. Her husband is not going to be allowed to take her back. We see from this source, that's not true. In the case of Hurana, okay, there she will, will assume that she'll be violated in the absence of formal testimony. But if they forcibly took her for money purposes, for their, their goal was to get money in her exchange, they won't violate her. That, as we said, that's a challenge to Rav Shmuel. The Gemara responds, not so. In other words, we read the source with Ashkelon and the Hurhanol case with an inference approach. In other words, we said, Hurhanol, there we would have to worry about uh, um, immorality, but in the case of Nechbesho, we wouldn't. Here the Gemara says, not so. Who hadin afilu nechbesha? The same would apply that our suspicion of immorality, even if they forcibly took her for money for in exchange for money. The story that took place in Ashkelon happened to be a story where she was taken as collateral, but the same would apply. Namely, that in the absence of formal testimony that she remained pure, we would have to assume that she was violated. And that is in accordance with Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yitzchak. Here we have a second version of Rava. This basically is a repeat type Gemara, but in a, just a different direction. Whereas Rava in the first uh, approach challenged Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yitzchak, here Rava brings the same Tanaic source as support to Rav Shmuel Rav Yitzhak. And note that we have a long point. This long point represents Rav trying to bring support. And at the end of the long point, the Gemara is going to reject it using the same logic as we just heard in the Gemara, which served as the uh, the response to Rava's challenge. Of course, all of this is the same information, just presented in a different direction. So, the second version is We have a Tanaic source to support Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak. And the source is Rav Yitzchak and her family distanced her and the same witnesses that said that she had been taken into captivity as um, as as collateral also testified that she remained.
pure. And the Chachamim said to the family, if you believe that she was taken as that she was taken by the uh, Gentiles as uh, collateral, then believe that she remained uh, she remained uh, pure. The im e ain atem aminim shelo nistro of a shalidma. If you refuse to believe that she remained pure, then al taminu shurana. Then don't believe either that she was taken into captivity as collateral. The Ashkelon dal yedei momon hu'have. The case of Ashkelon uh, was a, a matter of money. They were interested in getting cash. The taimo the edim meidim osa. And the reason she's muteris is because witnesses testified about her fidelity. Ha ein edim meidim oisolo. If there was no testimony concerning her purity, then she would be usher. My love, is it not so? Lo shno uranova lo shno nechbesha. She would not be allowed. Under either of the circumstances, whether her, her, her captivity was because of her being offered as collateral, or she was forcibly taken for ransom purposes in order to get money for her. So if we make no distinction, then Nech Bishal, that's the case that Rav Shul Bar Yitzchak told us, that when you have Yad, uh, even though it's a Momon situation, she is a goner. She is not going to be kosher, be allowed to be with her husband. Because we have to suspect, even though it's a money case, we have to suspect that the captors will have violated her. The Gemara says, Lo, there is no support from this to Rav Shmuel by Yitzchak. Hura no shiny. The case in Ashkelon was specifically a case where she was re- given to them as collateral. In that case, they view her, when the debt isn't paid on time, as their possession. And that will lead them to violate her. But in, uh, a, an, 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 in the other kind of case, the Nechbesha case, they're not going to violate her because they'll fear, they'll feel they'll lose the money they're trying to get for her. Now we go to Roman numeral number two. Again, once again, it's basically the same concepts, just presented in a different fashion. There are those that present two Tanaic sources, pit them off against one another. We saw in our Mishnah that Goyim, that uh, uh, Gentiles that, that, that capture a Jewish woman, a, woman uh, a married Jewish woman, for money purposes, in exchange for money, <coughs> when they release her, uh, she can go back to her husband. But we raise as a contradiction. Hey, Reb Yosi Here the Gemara is saving ink. It's terse. It's the it's the quote with the story of Ashkelon. V'ho Ashkelon de Momon. The case of Ashkelon was uh, Gentiles taking a married Jewish woman for money purposes. The Kotoni, and we were taught Taimo the Edomidimo saw the reason she's muteris to her husband is because witnesses. Verify that. Ha ain't a to meet him solo. In the absence of witnesses, she would not be allowed to her husband. So that is a contradiction to our mission. Our mission has said if the Goyim took her for money purposes and they release her, she can go back to her husband. Assuming we are assuming no violation took place, um, uh, no contamination of the woman took place, and yet in the Ashkelon story, we do assume the contamination took place. Umeshani. Omer Rav Shmuel Rav Yitzchak. Here, Rav Shmuel Yitzchak comes to resolve the contradiction between the two sources, saying, "Lo kashi, there's no, dis, no, there's no difficulty." Kan shiad Yisrael takif al oiv dekechavim. The case where uh, our, our Mishnah, where she's muteris, that's because the ruling authority was a Jewish authority, and the goyim that had taken her were worried uh, concerning their own welfare having uh, violated a married Jewish woman <clears throat> because of the supervising Jewish authority. Kan sheyad takifa al atzmon the case in Ashkelon where in the absence of witnesses she would be considered as having been violated even though it's a money matter. That's a case where the supervising, the ruling authority was a Gentile idol idolatrous authority, where they 
aren't worried about any repercussions uh, in, in having violated the married Jewish woman. We also learned in our Mishnah, if she was taken by the Goyim and, uh, uh, for, and, and, and uh, you see, subject to execution, so uh, she will be considered ostracized. If whatever happens afterwards, she ends up getting away and released from them, uh, we will assume that she willingly had intimacy with the uh, captors. Omar Rav, Kigoin Hani Noshi Deganvi. Rav says that the case of the Foshos are women whose husbands were executed, her, whose husbands were hung, and in a case like that, where their husbands were executed, the wives are viewed by the, by the, uh, the Goyim uh, as being uh, f- um, f- uh, free booty to do with them as they please. The Levi Omar Kegoyim Ishto Shel Ben Dunoi. Uh, the example of a woman that would be considered violated by the Goyim is a case like the wife of Ben Dunoy. Ben Dunoy was a murderer. And uh, according to Rashi, Levi's position is that when you're dealing with the wife of a murderer, so she will be considered uh, uh, free booty to do with as they please. But the wives of thieves would not be considered so free in the eyes of the Goyim. Omar Chizkiah Vahushin Nigmar Dinon Lahariga. The point at which the, uh, the, the wife of these criminals would be considered uh, free booty is if the husbands received a formal uh, death sentence. Nigmar Din is the, the final sentence was handed down. Rabbi Yochanan Mafopisha lo Nigmar Dinon Lariga, even if they if their husbands were not actually sentenced to death. Um, I'm sure uh, you you noted that the translation we gave to this case in the Mishnah was different than that which the, how the Gemara explained it, but when we learned the Mishnah and it said, Al-Yadayna Fashos, Rashi said there, Shohoisa Nidonis Lamavas, she was sentenced to death. Uh, that, of course, is, a, is, is Rashi in presenting the Mishnah on its, on its we'll call it on its um, superficial or basic translation level. The Gemara itself we can we can say that there's the same concept as she's nidonis lamoves because their husbands were sentenced to death, so their the the wives become uh, free booty to do with whatever they want, including killing her. Maybe that's a shot, but the but the Gemara itself, if you look in Rashi over here, hani noshi de Gandhi in the upper part of the narrow line, shebaleim nitlin, their husbands were hung. The derech hamalchus laafkir beisam and the way of the government after they kill the husbands, the the wives and, and their property is is considered the, their booty. And next Rashi, Ben Dunoy, wrote Seachoya, the Lozer Shmo, Ben Dunoy was, his name was El Lozer, and Uchlamrinam, Bevergeg Larufa, Avol Noshi de Ganvi, Hagonvim, Hagonvin Momon Lomafri, but the, the, uh, the wives of, of, uh, of uh, people who steal money as opposed to murderers, those, according to this approach, according to the approach of Levi, uh, they, w- the, those kind of wives would not become uh, Osser. Uh, to us, us to their husbands.